Hi, this is chapter uh, six, Axial Skeleton of Anatomy. Um, we're not gonna go through pages of the chapter. I'm going to go through all the bones in the order that they appear in the lab manual. So have your ma lab manual handy um, and let's get started. Um, the axial skeleton includes the skull and the sternum and ribs, the vertebral column, which includes your sacrum and coccyx. So we're gonna go through all of that in this lecture. We're going to begin with the skull and the cranial bones. So two-thirds of your skull is considered the cranial bones. The cranial bones are going to be the ones that house the brain. And then one-third of your skull is considered facial bones because they are going to form the face. So we're going to begin with cranial bones. Um, looking at page 63 of your lab manual, we have some sutures that we need to identify, um, which are joints between two bones. Sutures are immovable joints, they do not move, um, and they look like little lines on the skull. So the sagittal suture is a suture you want to know, and that's going to be um, binding the right and left parietal lobes, oh, sorry, parietal bones. The coronal suture is going to run along the coronal plane, or what was also called the frontal plane of the body and that's going to bind the frontal bone to the parietal bones. Then in the posterior <clears throat> of the skull, we have our lambdoid suture. This can also be called lambdoidal suture, and it's going to bind the occipital and parietal bones. And then we have the squamosal suture. Um, let me turn to that, sorry. Find the squamosal suture. This is a nice picture. The squamosal suture is going to run along where you see number 23. So it's going to um, bind the temporal bone to the parietal bone. All right, so those are the sutures you're going to want to identify on an exam. Let's begin with each bone of the cranium. Um, each bone contains parts, um, so landmarks, I call them landmarks, um, and all these features you will need to identify on an exam. Um, let's start with the frontal bone. So the frontal bone is going to form the top part of your orbits. The orbits are the eye socket the, and the majority of your forehead. Um, you can see from the list here that we need to identify the glabella. The glabella is going to be the area between the eyebrows. So kind of right here is called the glabella. Then we have the superciliary arches. So I'm going to be skipping some terms in your outline, in your lab manual um, because I do not ask them in, in class. They're sort of difficult to identify. So the lacrimal fossa, you can cross out. The superciliary arches are going to be bumps that appear on the skull. Now, it is difficult to see the superciliary arch in this image. It's going to be um, a raised area on the skull on the frontal bone where your eyebrows rest. Okay, on this Neanderthal, you can see he has a very prominent superciliary arch. But that's where your eyebrows are going to lay on top of. Now, the next term is supraorbital foramen or supraorbital notch. Supra means above, orbital means your orbit, and foramen is a hole. So foramen or foramen. So this is a supraorbital foramen. Now, some people have a notch. So um, I, if you look over on the other side, I think this is a little bit of a notch. So a notch is basically a notch, right? If you were to take a, a knife and cut a little divot out of the bone in this position, then sometimes it appears as a notch. Um, depending on your skull image that you have or actual skull, you may have a supraorbital foramen on one eye, a notch on the other eye. You might have two foramina, you might have two notches. Uh, it just depends on the skull. Um, then the next term is going to be supraorbital margin. So the supraorbital margin is just the border that forms the edge of your orbit. The squamous part of the frontal bone is going to be up here where it's going to be flat. So it's the flat, rounded region that forms most of the forehead. So remember the word squamous means flat in epithelial tissue. So 
um, squamous tissue, squamous cells were flat. Next, we have a frontal sinus. Now, when you see the word frontal sinus or when you see the word sinus, a sinus is a space, a cavity inside the bone. So this is a cavity inside the bone. So this is not something that you can see from the outside. This is something that you have to cut the bone apart to be able to see the cavity inside. And we can see the frontal sinus right here in this real image of a bone. The other two terms, the frontal crest. So the frontal crest is going to be right here. It's a ridge that is raised and then that leads to a foramen cecum and that's number two. There's a tiny hole here that um, allows transport of material between the inside of the skull where the brain is and the outside. Now, all the holes that are in your skull are to allow either blood vessels or nerves through, okay? So this is your foramen cecum. All right, um, the frontal crest and foramen cecum are actually not listed in this PowerPoint, so let's go ahead and add them. So frontal crest and foramen cecum. All right, and so that completes our list for the frontal bone. Moving on to the temporal bone. So there are two temporal bones. There's a right and left temporal bone, and they are going to rest where your ears are. So you can see the position in orange of the temporal bones. Now, let's get started. So if you're looking at this image, um, you will not be asked individual bones by themselves um, regarding the skull. So the skull will be given as the entire skull. You will have all different views of the skull, so that you'll have to identify regions and landmarks from the anterior view, posterior view, lateral view, um, inferior, superior views, which, um, so every single way that you can look at a skull, you'll have to be able to recognize these features. So this is just a, an interesting look at just what the temporal bone by itself looks like, but let's move on to the different parts. So looking at, I drew the um, squamous suture here. So the temporal bone, the temporal squama is where number 19 is. So it's a flat region of this bone. Um, the zygomatic process is going to be uh, number 18. So a process, okay, is a port, part of the bone that juts away from sort of the main body of the bone. So it can be a point, it can be a rounded um, protrusion. So the word process is anything that comes away from the sort of the main part of the bone. So this is what you're looking at here. So this is the zygomatic process. Now pay attention, so I'm gonna outline the zygomatic process here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, oops, switch colors. Oh, maybe not. All right, maybe not. But I'm gonna draw a suture line right here. So this is a nice big suture line. And then there's another bone that the zygomatic process touches, which is the zygomatic bone. So your cheek is the zygomatic bone. Okay, so the zygomatic process touches the zygomatic bone. From the zygomatic bone, it has a dotted, so I'll just do a dotted line to represent this part. This dotted area is gonna be the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And so the two processes together, the zygomatic process plus the temporal process, create the cheekbone that you have, and that area is called the zygomatic um, zygomatic arch. Okay? So the zygomatic arch contains two bones. It contains the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, and it also contains the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Okay, so hopefully that didn't lose you. Um, the whole process, the whole arch. So if you think about your cheekbones, the very top of your cheekbones, you're putting your hands on the zygomatic bone. And if you run your fingers across to where the um, hole of your ear is, that whole bridge of bone is the zygomatic arch. 
All right, so we spent a long time talking about this, but this is the zygomatic process. Now I want to show you the styloid process. The styloid process is a pointy projection down here where number 15 is. The styloid process helps to anchor muscles that hold um, your tongue and your hyoid bone in place. So it's a very important anchor for muscles. Um, the styloid word means pen-like. So a stylus, if you're using a stylus to, use, to um, write on your tablets, that's the, where the root came from. It's like a pen. So this point looks like a pen. Next is the mastoid process. So the mastoid process is going to have a nice rounded region that you can feel with your fingers. So if you were to take your finger behind your earlobe, actually behind your ear, and push on your skull, and you feel that rounded projection just directly posterior to the ear, that's gonna be your mastoid process. Um, and if you're wondering, right, we're looking at this hole, this is definitely the region where your, um, it's the ear canal, okay? Um, Coming down the list, just so if you wanted to look at the name of this number 16, it is called the external acoustic meatus. Um, you can also call it the external auditory canal. All right, so let's move on. So the next term in the list, um, I do not ask the mastoid foramen, so you can cross that one out. The next one in the list is called the stylomastoid foramen. So we need to turn the skull and look at it inferiorly and I know this picture is not the best, but if you look at number 10 here, we're gonna have a pointy projection, and this is our styloid process. And then we're gonna have our rounded process here, which is our mastoid process, okay? Between the two, there is a hole, number 11, and that's the stylomastoid foramen. And you can see from the notes that a branch of a cranial nerve comes out from there, you don't know you don't need to know what exactly comes through these openings, um, but it's just sort of for your, your own um, sort of curiosity that this one is a nerve. Okay, let's move on to the petrous part of the temporal bone. So for this region, we wanna look inside the skull. So this is gonna be the superior view. We have cut the skull in half, we moved the calvarium the calvarium is a word used for the top of the skull. I'll write it here, calvarium. Um, so we're looking down into the skull and we see a few things labeled here. So the petrous part of the temporal bone is also called petrous portion, but is a rocky area that is formed by the, temp the temporal bone. So I'll also circle on this side the rocky part. Okay, so it's, it kind of looks like a little mountain range. Um, another, so let's stay here and take a look at a few more things um, before we leave this view. So we're gonna jump down the list and we look at the internal acoustic meatus or internal auditory canal here. We can also see the um, carotid canal here, the jugular foramen here, and the foramen lacerum here. Now, <clears throat> in the skull, there is a region that looks kind of like uh, a saddle, and that's this region here. So this looks like a little seat. This area is called the cella tersica. Now, it's listed further on in the notes, but what I like to say to students is that if you were to sit in here like a cowboy, cowboys like lace and rum. So here's the word lace, rum. And so your feet of the cowboy would be hanging down into this foramen lacerum. Okay. And if you were trying to get your horse to move faster, you would kick back with your heel. So if you kicked back with your heel, you would actually find the carotid canal. So the foramen lacerum and the carotid canal are sort of linked together by a groove. And that groove um, does not have a name, or it probably does, but I, we're not learning it. Um, but that's the two, how they're linked together. So if you can think about the cowboy, lace rum, and then the carotid canal is something that's joined by a groove, as if you are sort of making a groove with your heel as you kick back. Um, the next two 
um, let's talk about the jugular foramen. So the jugular foramen, um, it's not obvious in this picture, but it does look like a little jelly bean. So the opening here is going to look like a little jelly bean. So we, I tell you guys to J for jugular, J for jelly bean, okay, jugular foramen. If you are familiar with your jugular vein, this is where the jugular vein exits your skull and brings the blood from your brain back down to your heart. The internal acoustic meatus, um, or sorry, internal acoustic meatus or internal auditory canal is a tiny little hole in this position here. And it's going to allow the, um, basically the, the nerve to hear, your auditory nerve to enter into the brain, okay? So those are the holes that exist in the temporal bone. Okay, we missed one term. We need to go back up and look at mandibular fossa. So I should have done this here. But looking at your inferior view of the skull, um, there is a depression. So the easiest way to see this is I'm going to follow my zygomatic arch to my skull, and I'm going to find a depression right here at the base of the jugular of your zygomatic arch. Same thing on this side, there's a depression. Everything is symmetrical. So if we wanted to find the zygomatic, sorry, the styloid process, it's the pointy process here. Here's the mastoid process. Here's our stylomastoid foramen. Number nine is gonna be our mandibular fossa. So your mandible, um, one of the bony projections of your mandible will fit here. Um, to form that hinge joint when you open and close your jaw, okay? All right, so that is the temporal bone. Moving on to the next bone, which is our ethmoid bone. Um, let me actually, let's start with parietal because it's the next in your list. Uh, parietal bones. So I just want to show you the parietal bones. I do not require anything under parietal bones. So parietal bones, you can cross out the superior inferior temporal lines. You can cross out parietal eminence. The parietal bone is just number one. So that's really easy. It's just going to be tied to the temporal bone by the squamous suture. So remember the squamous suture is right here. And it's going to be um, bound to the frontal bone by our coronal suture, as you can see here. Okay, moving back. Uh, to the ethmoid bone. So let's look at the ethmoid bone. So this is a bone that's going to be deeply located in the skull. You can only see little parts of it here and there. You can see parts of it um, in the eye or in the orbit, I should say in the orbit. You can see parts of it in the nasal cavity. You can see parts of it from above. So let's take a look at the um, ethmoid bone. From the superior view, we are going to find the ethmoid bone in brown, right? So the ethmoid bone is here. Um, we have a brown plate. So the cribriform plate is going to be this region of the bone that rests on, forms through the floor of the bone itself. The cribriform plate has holes in it. Those holes are called olfactory foramina. Now, this is one of the holes that I do want you to know what goes through. So the olfactory foramina has olfactory fibers. So olfactory nerve fibers. Okay, so your sense of smell. The olfactory nerve will rest above this cribriform plate and drop fibers down into the nasal cavity because what's right underneath this bone is the top of your nasal cavity. And so these are where those nerve fibers go through. Then we have a raised projection. We have this area here. This is called the Cristagalli. All right. And um, I think that might be it from this view. Yes. Okay. Now let's look at the ethmoid bone in a different way. So let's look at a real skull here and just review what we've talked about. So here I'm outlining for you the cribriform plate. Okay, notice how it looks holy. Those holes are called olfactory foramina. Number three 
is our Christogali. It's a big piece of bone that sticks up. All right, that is our nice ethmoid bone. Just a review for frontal bone, right? Remember this ridge of bone that's coming down, that's called the frontal crest. And number two, that little hole there is called the foramen cecum. All right, moving on to how we can see the ethmoid bone um, in the nose. This is also a very good different view of the Christogali, that piece of bone that sticks up. This is a nice different view of the cribriform plate. Okay, you can see it forms a plate that runs across. And I covered it up with my pen, but there's little tiny holes along the way. Now, in the nose, your ethmoid bone um, is forming the uh, nasal cavity. There's parts of it that form the nasal cavity. What you can see here are two projections from the lateral walls of your nasal cavity called concha. So there's a superior nasal concha and there's a middle nasal concha. Those are all parts of your ethmoid bone. We have a third inferior nasal concha, but it's not part of the ethmoid bone. It's actually a bone all by itself. It's a separate inferior nasal concha bone. All right, so let's take a look at the nasal cavity. Um, so, excuse me. All right, so we're gonna draw the nasal cavity as a triangle. So if you think about a skull, right? If you're drawing a skull, a cartoon of a skull, the nasal cavity is a triangle. We're going to make a bony division down the middle. Now this bony division down the middle is called your nasal septum. Okay, this, this whole thing is called the nasal septum. Now the nasal septum is mostly formed by the ethmoid bone. So I'm gonna draw a little line here and everything above my line is called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Perpendicular, oops, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. And that is going to be this part of the ethmoid bone. The second part of the nasal septum, the one that's the inferior portion, that's a different bone. That's the vomer bone. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the concha. So we have these ridges on the lateral sides of our nasal cavity. Okay. And those are all concha. So this is the superior nasal concha. This is the middle nasal concha. And this is the inferior nasal concha. Now, the superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha, these are ethmoid bone. Okay? The inferior nasal concha, remember, that was a separate bone. So I'm going to go ahead and darken all the parts that are the ethmoid bone. So the superior nasal concha, the middle nasal concha, those are the ethmoid bone, and then the perpendicular plate that goes down the nose to form most of your septum is also the ethmoid bone. The other portions are separate bones. The vomer bone forms the inferior nasal septum. The inferior nasal concha is a separate bone that forms that last bony projection. Okay, so that's your nasal cavity, and that's how the ethmoid bone fits into your nose or the nasal cavity. Now, you may have heard of people with a deviated septum. Um, if you have a deviated septum, that means that your nasal septum, let me just draw a little nasal cavity here, is off center, right? So it might be a little bit deviated. It could be very deviated. Sometimes people have it so severely, they have to break, um, the doctor has to break that nasal septum and then reset it to make it more uh, a medial structure and because it can block your breathing passages. All right, lastly, let's take a look at the ethmoid bone inside the orbit. So let's find the term orbital plate, um, also known as the orbital surface, also known as the lamina orbitalis. And so when you find the ethmoid bone in this picture, we can see that it's a little square piece that makes up your orbit. 
you can see that many bones actually make up your orbit. And you're going to want to know which bones make up your orbit because there might be a question um, like that on your exam. So this is your ethmoid bone. So that's the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone. Now, let me stop and just mention how you'll be asked questions on the exam. Um, we might, I might, uh, you'll have numbers or arrows pointing to uh, a bone. So if I had, um, oops, let's say I had a, hmm, a bone. So if I had like an arrow pointing here, I would say name the bone. You would say frontal bone. If I had, a, oops, if I had an arrow here, I would say name the opening, and you can say supraorbital foramen. I might also say name the landmark, in which you can say supraorbital foramen. The ethmoid bone, now, this is, if I point to this, and I said name the bone, this is the ethmoid bone, right? And it's, what bone is it? It's the ethmoid bone. But if I said name the landmark, then the landmark is the orbital surface, or you can say orbital plate. Right? Or you can use that third term, lamina orbitalis. But that is what you want to look for. So you want to look for, name the bone, know what bone it is, as well as the landmark. Okay, so that is your ethmoid bone. I think we've completed that. We've named, found all the structures there, the ethmoid bone. Moving on to sphenoid bone. Now, the sphenoid bone is um, an interesting bone. Let's look at it from this view. Actually, let me, excuse me as I find a good picture of this, this sphenoid bone here. So here's our sphenoid bone. Um, the sphenoid bone is, looks kind of like a, a flying animal, like a bat or a moth. And the body of the sphenoid bone would be this central region here, right? This is the body. And then the wings um, it's literally called the greater wing, so the, the bigger ones are the greater wing. And then you can see how there is an upper wing as well. There's a smaller wing, and that's called the lesser wing. Okay, so let's see how these wings in the body fit into the skull. So let's take a look at this picture. Let's find, so the body is going to be the general region 7, 8, 9, um, also encompassing 23. But um, the greater wing and lesser wing, the greater wing would be 15, and the lesser wing would be 6, okay? Then we have the term optic groove, which you can cross out. I do not cover optic groove. The optic canal, though, is number 10. So if you had a real skull in your hand, these openings, there's a hole here and there's a hole here. Those are called the optic canals, and those are going to go all the way through to the orbit. Now, let me find, let's see, here's that term optic canal. So that opening is from the sphenoid bone. In fact, all of the purple colored here is the sphenoid bone. So that optic canal allows the optic nerve to run through your, your, um, from your eye to your brain. So I do want you to know that the optic nerve travels through the optic canal. All right, moving through to the pterygoid process with lateral medial plates. Um, we need to look at the sphenoid bone from an inferior view. So we're going to look at this inferior view. So the pterygoid process is going to be this entire part of the, ter the sphenoid bone that drops down. And it's an anchoring point for muscles that help you chew. So think about this as behind the roof of your mouth coming down and the muscles will join with your mandible to help you move your mandible back and forth and up and down. This bone, this pterygoid process has two plates. It has two flat regions to it. Uh, they don't show up that great here, but there's a lateral pterygoid plate and there's a medial pterygoid plate. Okay, so over here, I'm outlining the lateral pterygoid plate, and this is your medial pterygoid plate. The medial pterygoid plates like this, lateral pterygoid plates like this. Okay, so those are your pterygoid plates. You can cross out pterygoid canal 
Now let's, the sphenoid sinus is also something that you cannot see in an image. You just need to know that the sphenoid bone also has a space or a cavity inside called the sphenoid sinus. Let's look for the superior orbital fissure and inferior orbital fissure. So orbital means that we need to look into the orbit. So let me just make this bigger. So we have these slash-like openings on the top and another slash-like opening on the bottom. So those are your two fissures. We have a superior orbital fissure and an inferior orbital fissure. So fissures are long, sort of elongated cracks, openings in a, in a bone. Those are for, of course, nerves, both nerves and blood vessels. Okay. Um, now let's move on to uh, the terms anterior clinoid process and then a lot of holes and then the cella turcica. So what we would need to do is we need to look at um, this region, this picture. So I want you guys to look at the cella turcica. Let's start with the cella turcica. So the cella turcica is uh, a region that holds your pituitary gland it houses your pituitary gland and it cradles it so that it protects it. The pituitary gland is an incredibly important hormone producing gland. It extends down from the brain. It's the size of a pea and it rests right here in this region called a hypophyseal fossa. So another name for the pituitary gland is your hypophysis. So the hypophyseal fossa is where it rests. Now the word fossa means depression. So any fossa of bone is a depression in that bone. So let's look at the rest of the parts of your, of your cella turcica. So remember this is that saddle that the cowboy sat in. So the front of the saddle, if he's facing forward, is the tuberculum cellae. It's a little bump here. This is all the tuberculum cellae. Then the dorsum cellae is the back of his saddle. The back of his saddle has two, has two ends, right? There's the end here. Those are called posterior clinoid processes. So your tuberculum cellae, the hypophyseal fossa, the dorsum cellae, and the posterior clinoid processes all create the cella turcica, the Turkish saddle. Now let's move on and look at our, our anterior. Let's go ahead and name our anterior clinoid process, which we see here. The anterior clinoid process is this little projection, this tip of your lesser wing. Okay, now we want to find the holes. So I like to think about um, a mnemonic here. So Ross, my friend Ross goes to spin class because the first opening here is the foramen rotundum with an R. The second one is the foramen ovale. So here's rotundum, this is ovale. And then the third one is very small and it's called the foramen spinot spinosum. So spin class is spinosum. Okay. So those are the three openings in the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Let's review. There's an opening right here as well. This was listed under the temporal bone. So that was the foramen lacerum. Remember a cowboy liked lace rum. So this is our foramen lacerum. Okay. I think we've covered everything of the sphenoid bone. Now let's move on to occipital bone. Okay, let's see. Oops, that's our facial bones. All right, just re let's review really quick the sphenoid bone looking at our real skull. So we have our lesser wing here. We I'm sorry, this is the greater wing the greater wing. This is our lesser wing. Okay. Now, when we look at our openings, we can see number 12. This is our Ross. This is the foramen rotundum. This is foramen ovale. Notice the hole is more oval. This is foramen spinosum. Ross goes to spin class. Remember this guy? This guy was the foramen lacerum. And then over here, if you dug your heels in, you would find the carotid canal. Those are both temporal bones. I'm just reviewing here. Now, let's look at the, um, the sort of body of our sphenoid bone. 
We're going to look at number 10. This is an opening. We can't see the opening from this angle, but there are holes. You could actually stick a toothpick or some kind of structure through there. Those are our optic canals. Then we have our cella tersica, which includes number seven, our tuberculum cellae, our depression, our hypophyseal fossa, our posterior part, the dorsum cellae, and the dorsum cellae has two posterior clinoid processes. Our anterior clinoid processes are little tips of our lesser wing. Let me see what else. Um, what's not visible are the fissures, the superior and inferior orbital fissures, but you would have to look. That's what 25 is pointing at. There's a fissure right under there. All right, so I think that is sufficient for this sphenoid bone. Now let's look at our occipital bone. So the occipital bone is the back of the head. Um, there's only one of these, and it's going to be this brown bone that we see. And the first landmark in your list is occipital condyles. So this is your occipital condyle. These are smooth. So what a condyle is of bone is a smooth area, typically a little rounded, so that it can form a nice joint with another bone. The entire skull is going to rest on the very first vertebra of your vertebral column. And this is where it does this. This occipital condyle will rest on the vertebra called C1. It's the very first of your whole vertebral column. So this is where your head contacts your vertebral column. All right, so we have occipital condyles. Then we have a really nice foramen magnum, meaning big hole. Right, so the foramen magnum, I do want you to know that this is where your spinal cord emerges, which I think is pretty intuitive. And then we have something called the condyloid canal. Um, this is going to be not in this picture here. Let's actually Let's skip that for now. Let's look at the external and internal occipital crests as well as the external and internal occipital protuberances. So let's stay with this one. So the crest is going to be this crest of bone, this raised part of bone that goes up and down. Then you have um, an external protuberance. So we find that here, it's basically a very big bony projection. And you can feel this on the back of your skull, right? It's a bony bump right before your neck kind of takes a dip down. Um, inside, we have the same thing. Inside of your skull, we have an internal occipital crest and an internal occipital protuberance, okay? Now, there are other structures called nuchal lines. So let's take a look at this picture. So the red arrow is pointing to our external occipital protuberance. So the protuberance is this big bump. Then the nuchal line, you can see how there is a raised, the bone is kind of raised and goes off in this direction and then kind of goes off in this direction, right? That's your superior nuchal line. And then we have another area, this blue arrow, pointing to kind of a, a textured, area that kind of go, runs like this, like a little smile on both sides. Those are your inferior nuchal lines. These lines appear on your skull because they're um, muscles attached there. And when muscles pull on your bone, your bone grows in thickness because it responds to the stress. Remember in chapter five, we talked about how bones can actually grow thicker in response to stress. So muscle attaching, if, when a muscle attaches to a bone, the site of attachment is under more stress. So the bone will thicken in response to that muscle moving. And so that creates lines and it creates protuberances. So that's what we have there. Um, the hypoglossal canal is going to be um, difficult in a picture, but the hypoglossal canal is going to be um, in this area, two little holes, they're canals, so they're openings. And it's not in this picture as well, but um, you would have to rotate the skull up and there's a hole right underneath the condyles. So beneath the condyles, we're gonna have, I'll just draw them in. That's where you're gonna have your hypoglossal canal. Hypoglossal. Okay. 
Um, and then the last term, fossa for cerebellum, is going to be this area here, so 18. There's a depression, you know, it's just kind of a nice big space, and that's where your cerebellum from the brain, you have a, a structure called the cerebellum, it rests in those areas. So that's the fossa for cerebellum. Let's go back up to condyloid canal. I was saying it wasn't labeled, but it is present. So this is our condyloid canal. So it's right by your condyles, two little openings. Those are your condyloid canals. All right. Um, that is it for the occipital bone. Now let's finish up with our auditory ossicles from this area. Moving down my PowerPoint here. Oh, where'd happen to my ossicles? Oh, I think they're at the end. Okay, let me just move over there so we can finish up. So the auditory ossicles, they are your malleus, your incus, and your stapes. So there are three tiny little bones. You can see how small they are. They are in your middle ear and they help to transmit sound waves. Now we'll talk more about these in the ear chapter but we are going to just be able to recognize the names at this point. There's no need to recognize the shapes. Just recognize the auditory ossicles can include the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. All right, so we're gonna pause here and start facial bones in the next part.